Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is really a privilege for me to welcome you all, albeit virtually, as we move towards uh, some very exciting times in terms of our COVID history. And I can't wait. In this time of limited interaction and engagements, I really can't wait till I can see you all again, press flesh and look into your eyes and watch the body language and really start interpreting the real meaning behind what's being said. So a very warm welcome to you. I don't, I, I really, as I, as I sit here today, I'm still trying to fathom out and come to terms with all the conflicting messages, with the under-research commentary, trying to disseminate the information as best I can, and try and draw a distinction between what is what is constructive and what is intended to undermine the best efforts of everyone around the table. But there are a couple of things that are just some opening remarks that I feel compelled to mention. Reading some articles, including the KPMG report recently about what CEOs have to say around the world and in South Africa, and also reading our new finance minister, Enoch Godongwana's remarks uh, which he made at the recent Sunday Times Investment Dialogue. I'm more confused than ever, and I've got time to sit and analyze this information. So quite frankly, I don't know how board of directors and the executive leadership of corporates and companies in South Africa are making head or tail of the mixed messaging that's coming through for us. So it's against that background particularly when it is being suggested and based on the broadly held perception that corporate South Africa has a disproportionate presence at the negotiating table. Uh, I think many of you will agree that that is a perception that exists out there. And I think if we're going to really start analyzing it and unpacking just what that means for us, and more importantly, for our recovery prospects as a country moving forward, we can do no better than have Cascuvadia with us today. Known as a respected commentator for his incisive analysis on all matters facing South Africa, whether they be socio-political, socio-political, socio-economical, you're going to get it straight from the shoulder. So Cas, mindful that you, you, we were privileged to host you last year, I think it was in June, July, and it was by popular demand, as they say, that we approached you and you very graciously agreed to once again address us on this vexed question of is South Africa, corporate South Africa being heard? Cass, I'm not going to do your bio justice. Cass is the CEO of Business Unity South Africa and the former MD of the Banking Association of South Africa. And in, it was in that capacity, Cass, that I first had the privilege of meeting you. He is currently the chairperson of the National Business Initiative and serves on several boards, such as the Centre for Development and Enterprise and the BPAD Business Foundation. He is also the past president of the International Banking Foundation, serves on the council of the University of Twatersrand, as well as the steering committee of the CEO initiative. Cass, without any further ado, over to you. Great. Thank you, and, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so, is the question, is the issue that we're trying to discuss that business has too much of, has too much time on the table with government, or is the issue that we're not making an impact? And I guess the two are related. Uh, in, in the South African context, if you ask whether business has too much time at government's table, uh, I think the answer is an ambivalent one, to be quite honest. Do we have entree? Uh, can we meet the president often if we need to? Can we meet ministers often? Uh, uh, yes, we can. Uh, we, by and large, have a receptive uh, cabinet and president, and we are able to meet with them. 
do we have sufficient substantive bilaterals with government and with the president i would have to say the answer is no because on a number of the critical sort of broader uh, structural reform and and broader environmental issues uh, the government seems more comfortable discussing those multilaterally at NEDLAC, and I'm sure everybody is aware of what NEDLAC is, but uh, for those who may not be, it's an acronym for the National Economic Development and Labor Council, which, and it's a, a, a body that was formed by statute in the early days of democracy, and it's meant to be a, a, a social dialogue forum between business, labor, government, and community groups. Uh, so if one goes back to the days of, let's say, President Mbeke, where he had a big business working group uh, that we put together, and he used to meet with us regularly as the big business working group. Uh, we don't have that with the current president. And in a meeting, in fact, that we had, I think it was about two weeks ago now, we actually raised this, that we, on critical issues facing this country, have not had the time to sit down uh, for a good period of time and have a frank discussion on some of the critical issues and see if we can get onto the same page. And these issues relate to uh, the economic climate, the lack of investment, the uh, uh, issue related to polit political uncertainty, policy uncertainty, uh, the state of the governing party currently, although Business traditionally does not get involved in politics. My view is that politics is getting involved in business and what's happening in the governing party uh, is having an impact, a negative impact on government and on, on the economy. Uh, on issues related to climate change, on re issues related to implementation issues on the spectrum, on the renewables, on uh, sorting our licensing and other business sort of processing or, or ease of doing business issues, a whole range of issues. And we haven't had at the level of the president and critical ministers that sort of a bilateral. And, and the upshot of the meeting we had two weeks ago, uh, which was a meeting between business and there were about eight, nine of us, and the president and his advisors, the president agreed, and, and we've got a commitment to, after the local government elections, to have a substantive bilateral with the president and appropriate ministers. So, if you compare, let us say, the time that an organization like COSATU might have with government, as against the time that business might have with government, I would say that COSATU would probably have more time simply because they are part of an alliance with the ANC. And they are also a critical block that government and certainly the ANC looks towards when it comes to mobilizing for elections. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an unusual environment in that uh, the government has become uh, averse to openly and frankly having discussions with business bilaterally on the critical issues. We're hoping that that will change now immediately after the elections. Also, I think the interactions we do have and particularly at NEDLAC. So we've been engaged at NEDLAC on the economic recovery issues for the last three years or so. For the last year and a half or so, uh, we've been engaged on 
the what the government announced as their economic recovery strategy post COVID. We've been engaged on that for the last year and a half, more or less. Uh, and with very little progress, to be quite honest. We developed at NEDLAC out of that economic recovery strategy, what we call an economic recovery action plan, which was a list of, in our view and in the view of NEDLAC constituencies, actually labor and community as well, list of actionable items in the short term for government in particular, but also for business and labor. And we presented that to the president on the 15th of September last year. And some of those only started being actioned early this year. So one of those was, was the issuing of the request for proposal for the next tranche of renewables, which the government had already taken a decision on a while ago, but had not implemented. Uh, in our view, because of the, the misalignment amongst between some ministers on where we want to take our energy mix. Uh, so there's a minister who would be who's very behind fossil fuels. There are other ministers who appreciate the need to move towards renewables. ESCOM now appreciates the need to move towards renewables, as, uh, uh, as the CEO has made very clear. But that was only implemented about six, seven months after we presented it to the president. The auction for the spectrum was also in that document on the 15th of September, and then urgent output again was only implemented in the first quarter of this year and was botched so badly that it's now part of a legal contest between uh, the telecoms and ENCAs of this world and, and uh, the uh, regulator. Uh, we indicated in that document that outstanding issues that are delaying the uh, issuing of licenses for mining exploration be resolved. Those have still not been resolved. We haven't had mining exploration in this country for probably a decade. And my mining members tell me that if we resolve that, if we resolve the licensing issues in the next year, we can get substantial investment into mining exploration. So I think that there are a couple of issues here. One, do we have excess? Yes. Two, have we had substantive bilaterals? No, which we hope we will have post the elections. Three, has the NEDLAC process which is a multilateral process at high level. So we have meetings between leaders of business, ministers in government, leaders in labor, leaders in, from community groups, but it has had no real impact. Uh, one, because it's not a forum where we can all get onto the same page very easily. And secondly, the serious implementation issue in government. Uh, so that's that's what the situation looks like at the moment. Uh, all of that, I mean, the fact that COVID was then COVID exacerbated an already poor situation. Uh, the reality is that we were in recession as an economy pre-COVID, and you know, people saying that probably by the end of next year we'd probably be where we were pre-COVID from an economic point of view. Uh, that's not a great place to be. In, the, in all of this, particularly because of COVID, uh, we seem to have forgotten that we a country that's rated at sub-investment grade. And when we start going out into the market to raise money, we're going to find that we're going to have to pay a premium for that. So we don't have the luxury of uh, 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 projects that some people in government might like, but have no uh, positive impact on investment and on economic growth because we don't have money for those projects. 
And if we're going to try and raise money in the market for those projects, we're going to pay a premium for it. And our debt to GDP ratio will, will be severely impacted. So, and then all of this, again, another exacerbating factor was the July, uh, I call it an insurrection. Uh, uh, President called it that, I agree with him. I think this was a planned thing. And I think it's going to try, be tried again. And again, their implementation has been poor. We were found to be wanting in intelligence, in uh, the police and army in law and order. Uh, the president has put together a team to look at that, and we will be meeting with that team actually as business next week. But very little has happened, and, and the 12 or so suspects that uh, government said they've identified have not been arrested, uh, and, and we haven't rebuilt confidence subsequent to that incident. Uh, and that's another exacerbating factor. So, having said all of that, how do we move forward? The one is, after the cabinet reshuffle, uh, we would have liked to see a smaller cabinet, uh, but uh, there's no, uh, we can't be idealistic about these issues. So let's be pragmatic about the cabinet reshuffle. Uh, we didn't get a small cabinet. Some people who should have been fired totally were redeployed, like uh, the Minister of Defense, who instead of being fired was actually redeployed into being the second most, or the third most important position in government as Speaker of Parliament. Uh, the Minister of Intelligence was redeployed as Minister of some other ministry, I can't remember what. So we weren't happy with that. But what we are relatively happy with is one, we believe that the new Minister of Finance is somebody we can work with. We believe that the Minister in the Presidency, Monde Gungubele, is somebody we can work with. We believe that taking intelligence into the Presidency at this point in our history in the time in our country, we believe the right thing to do and to get Sidney Mufamadi to be the president's advisor on that is the right thing to do. Uh, so we believe that there's a window of opportunity to particularly work with the Minister of Finance and we've had a number of meetings with him and the Minister in the presidency, both of whom have indicated publicly, the Minister of Finance has indicated publicly that we can't have projects like the basic income grant. We have to have more sustainable solutions to poverty, inequality and unemployment, and that we've got to grow our economy. Uh, and uh, we agree with that. Uh, he spoke at the BUSA AGM and he was quite clear that uh, government and business needs to work very closely together and enable business to actually grow businesses, develop businesses, create jobs. And that we need to get investment in, but we're not going to get it in until we make some uh, uh, structural reform in the economy. So we believe that there's a window of opportunity to work with this minister. Uh, unlike the previous minister, he is, Enoch is more connected into the ANC and has a, a, a history within the ANC and is a respected member of the ANC as in Mondli Gungobele. And so they're not sort of at the edges of the ANC saying their own thing. They'll be informed by discussion in the ANC and they'll be able to actually take discussions with business back into the ANC and try to influence there. Uh, in our meeting with the president, it became quite clear that the Minister of Finance is already having an influence. And the president actually told us that he has shown the president chapter and verse, something we've been telling the president for four years. 
But anyway, he has shown that President chapter and verse how inappropriate regulation and red tape is stifling business, stifling the economy, and stifling our ability to create jobs. And the president was quite clear we've got to deal with those issues urgently. So we think that there is a window of, of opportunity to begin to pull something together, support the Minister of Finance and the Minister of the Presidency, support initiatives like uh, Operation Rudinzella, which is under Treasury and the Presidency, which is looking at a focused range of issues, has pulled together good capacity in there, including from the private sector, and is trying to drive those focus range, range of issues. So the 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 uh, increase uh, of embedded generation ceiling to 100 megawatts came directly from Operation Rudinzella's work. And so we believe that there are pockets of excellence that we should be working with, we should be supporting, and we should be making those incremental differences while we continue to address some of the broader structural reform issues. Uh, we also clear and we made it clear to the president that the time has come for him to show the sort of leadership that says we are open for business and there's no buts behind that. We are open for business, for investment, and his entire cabinet has got to be aligned behind. That. And, and any legislation that they want to look at has got to be tested against whether it's good for investment or bad for investment. Uh, uh, and so, you know, we need to, in our bilaterals, impress that upon them. And also, impress upon him that he's got to create an environment where his ministers and departments are receptive to private sector capacity and assistance, because that's the only sort of short term way of dealing with the capacity issue in government. Um, so, you know, these are the issues. These are the issues in the time we do have with government through various ministers, and departments we raise uh, in the meetings, couple of meetings we have had with the president, but they've been one and a half, two hour meetings. We raise those. We, between us, BUSA and Business Leadership South Africa, we are putting together at the request of the president at that meeting, a list of critical issues we believe need to be seriously discussed at the bilateral and we will make that available to him. And in that bilateral, we hope to get onto the same page with some of these issues, including how it is communicated by government, how they get aligned behind the president, how private sector resources, uh, capacity in particular, mobilized, but there's a receptivity for that capacity in government, in key areas of government, uh, and, and how we actually uh, collaborate between the pri private sector and government to actually begin to grow this economy. And those are the critical issues. So, and, and, and then obviously we will continue to engage with labor and community groups and others through NetLab, but it's got to be on the basis of a substantive bilateral between us and government and getting onto the same page on, an, on as many of the issues as possible so that we're not in a multilateral forum trying to reach agreement between business and government. We need to do that beforehand uh, and, and then take that into NEDLA. So that's, those are the issues. That's how we're trying to deal with them, hoping for, and we will certainly be pushing for a substantive bilateral after the elections, we should see the start of a process of bilaterals between government under the presidency and ourselves, uh, working with the Minister of Finance and the Minister of the Presidency, supporting uh, uh, some of the glimmers of light, like Operation Wulin Lela uh, under Treasury and the presidency that's trying to make a difference. Uh, and, and, and through all of that, hopefully uh, beginning to show a sort of SA Inc. approach towards uh, uh, saying that we need to attract investment, 
we need to build an economy within the context of free market principles. Uh, we can structure that economy to make sure that it, it is inclusive and it does need to be inclusive. We can't have sustained economic growth if the majority of the people in this country don't have a stake in that economy. And in different ways, in different forms, we've got to ensure that the majority of the people do have a stake in that economy, uh, be it through job creation, be it through SME development, be it through appropriate infrastructure projects that improve people's lives, be it through uh, 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 an appropriate implementation of black economic empowerment that actually contributes to growth and contributes to sustainable businesses. Uh, we need to do that. Uh, an inclusive economy that is an imperative as part of this process. But in, an inclusive economy and, and economic growth and sustained economic growth are complementary. They're not against each other. So those are the issues. That's how we're going to deal with them. That's how we've been dealing with them. And, and we're hoping that post the election we make substantive progress. Let me stop there. I don't know if I've covered my brief. Absolutely. Cass, thank you so much. You, you certainly did that and more. Um, what we're hearing, and, and that is encouraging, that, that yes, business is at the table, but no, we're not quite where we need to be in terms of getting ourselves heard, but there is a plan going forward to make sure that these uh, constructive engagements uh, de deliver uh, in terms of reform policies that will drive our economy in a positive direction. So yes, Cash, you certainly did do that. Um, you very kindly agreed to take some questions and uh, you've kept to your time. Gracious, you've done this before, Cass, so thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm going to kick too off. Too often. <laughs> too often. I'm going <laughs> to... Cass, I'm going to open the batting uh, during this Q&A session and I'm encouraging people either to use the chat facility to pose their questions. I will happily facilitate that. And then also feel free to use the uh, raise your hand facility if you would prefer to pose your question directly to Cass. So I'm going to kick off with a question from uh, Greg Carolyn of uh, DPI International uh, addressed to you, Cass. What glimmers are there that gives you the view that the interaction between business and government will improve and why? Yeah, so to a certain extent, I tried to address that. I, I, I think that if I look at the last meeting we had with the president and compare that to previous meetings, I saw a significant difference. And that's primarily because of the influence of the Minister of Finance on he. He essentially told us in so many words that the Minister of Finance has told him that he wants to move in next to where he's staying. His office must be next to him and they need to be <laughs> tied together as Siamese twins. <laughs> and that there's no other way other than private sector led growth out of the quandary we are in. Uh, I, the fact that he has committed to a bilateral and we will hold him to that. The fact that he has indicated that it is now also his priority to make it easier to do business in the country, to get rid of the red tape, to uh, reconsider inappropriate regulations. So and those aren't things that he's told us before. So, so we think that there is a glimmer of hope given that. I, I think that there's also I mean, this is a murky world, what's happening in the ANC, but there's absolutely no doubt that his position on the National Executive Committee of the ANC has strengthened uh, with the expulsion of some of the people, with the resolution of stepping aside and the recent development in, I think it was in Pumalanga, where the an MEC is on trial for murder. Uh, the MEC was fired immediately, uh, which is something we haven't seen before. So, and, and the president was at pain as telling us, as is, I think, addressed in, to the, in either, some of his addresses to the nation, that the ANC is at a turning point. Now we can debate whether they are there, whether you can save the ANC and all that. That's for another day, but I think that just given where he is, given that 
he has to a certain extent consolidated his power in the certainly in the national executive committee uh, and and given two key appointments in my view uh, as ministers and then a key appointment in in the security establishment of Sidney Mufamadi, who uh, I think is a very credible person and, and very well versed in intelligence. Uh, I think that there's there's a glimmer of hope. Uh, yeah. Cass, th thank you for that comprehensive response. I, th I think what we uh, what we are hearing is is almost a level of uh, high levels of frustration coming through with a lack of movement. And that is why it's so critical for us to engage and to participate in meaningful, constructive dialogues such as these, uh, where people will have the opportunity to speak constructively and frankly, and to, to lift the covers uh, and get a meaningful response to their concerns. Uh, I think it, we, we are deserving of better, and it, that we are seeing that coming through in the... Uh, so thank you for that very comprehensive response. I have another one in that vein from Julie Tugertha um, of OpenText. Cass, in your opinion, will Cyril Ramaphosa get re-elected in the ANC conference in 2022? And if so, is this an outcome that would be positive for the business community in South Africa? Over to you, Cass. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I think the local government elections will be a good pointer. Uh, if the ANC does well in the local government elections, I think it will consolidate his position. If the ANC does badly, as some pundits, pundits are saying, I mean, number one, registrations for voting is down. So which shows what you said just now, that there's a, a, a lack of confidence in the political parties uh, and in the electoral system at the moment. Um, but as I said earlier, I think certainly in the last few months, he, he certainly becomes stronger on the National Executive Committee. Uh, uh, so so that's that's a positive. I think that that he uh, the work he's done, although lots of work needs to be done on corruption. Uh, I think the movements we've seen on acting against some of the leadership of the ANC, like Ace Mahashue, like this MEC in, in, in Pumalanga recently, uh, uh, are, are sort of glimmers of hope. Uh, I think the sort of, and, and the problem is that in this gloom, the little positives become sort of virtually disappear, but they're important because the fact that he came out and announced the 100 megawatt ceiling for embedded energy, uh, clearly knowing, and it was public knowledge that the that Minister Mantash was not in favor of that. He overrode the minister and he did what was correct for the economy. Uh, the announcement of uh, uh, hiving off the ports into a separate entity under Transnet was also a good announcement. Uh, and again, he made the announcement, he took the decision. Uh, and that's the sort of leadership we're looking for from, from the president. Uh, so I, I think if the ANC remains as it is, as, an, as a, a single organization now, and and by the time you get to the 2022 elections, that's that is the ANC. That's how they are. I think that it would be good for business for the Suriname Plaza to be president again. I I don't think we have too many choices. If the ANC cannot sort out its internal problems, and if Cyril does not use his consolidated base in the in the NEC to actually really and seriously and publicly uh, clean the house there and either one the sort of destructive forces take precedence or if there's a split in the AMC then obviously we're looking at a different ballgame 
and and this is as I said, it's a murky area. It's it's an uncertain area. Um, but but right now, I think that what we have got to do is we have got to identify those people in government, and obviously the members of the ANC, those people in government and in the cabinet who we think we can work with who would be willing to listen to our side of the argument, might need to be convinced, but would be uh, willing to listen. And we need to work with them and back those people up to actually make a difference in government and through that in the ANC, to show in the ANC that if we do think in a particular way in government, we can make progress and, and that progress ultimately benefits uh, and improves people's lives. And, and that's the best we can do right now. Identify those people, work with them, back them up, uh, convince them, and, and help them make a difference in government and in the ANC. Cass, thank you. Thank you again for that response. I'm certainly addressed the, the fundamentals of that question. And I think just uh, following on upon that, another question from Greg Carolyn of DPI, who says, Cass, Based on what you are saying, I'm doubtful that it will improve due to the two factions in the ruling party and the continued deployment of questionable ministers to important portfolios. Now, you did touch on that in your addressing one of yeah. the earlier questions. Would you like to unpack that slightly more, Cass? No, I, I think I have addressed that. And that, that's why I say that, you know, the two factions might lead to a split. And if it does, then, then I think, you know, you we need to look at the situation at that time and and we need to then as business either take a view that we the affection that's got the sort of people we could work with and we could start working with them or well we have to look at it at that point in time but uh, there's undoubtedly there's factions uh, those factions are playing themselves out and all i've said is that call it, if you like, the faction that's backing Cyril, uh, has taken the upper hand in the last few months. Uh, uh, I think the insurrection of July uh, was undoubtedly engineered by the faction opposed to Cyril. Uh, and, and while they created, caused a lot of damage, if you look at subsequent to that, they called marchers and they asked for people to come out on the streets and so on, and the masses did not respond. They don't have that sort of mass support, but they do have the capability of creating a lot of mischief. Uh, and so we're just going to have to watch this as it plays out. Uh, it, it's just the, to be pragmatic about it, it's a reality we're facing the, in the governing party. If we had, and that's why I said earlier on, that there's lack of confidence in the political system in our country at the moment, not just in the ANC. Uh, the fact that we've got so few registrations for this local government or less registrations for the local government elections say that people are not happy with any party. And the reality is that we don't have a viable opposition at the moment. Uh, and, and, and that needs to play out. So. So yeah, look, I, 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 I hear the skepticism, I hear the frustrations, but uh, you know, we've got to do the best with what we've got. Thank you for that robust response to, to, to a very difficult question. I think it, it's difficult to, to make a call on what people are doing, what their motives are, what their agendas are. I think we can second guess it, but I believe that's a dangerous pastime, um, particularly if it tends to destruct what we're trying to build up. So, so thank you for that, Cass. Uh, folks, I really would urge you to, to frame your questions using either the chat facility or raise your hands, and I promise you I will recognize you. Um, we do have Cass for a maximum of 11 minutes. So folks, make, make use of this opportunity to frame your questions and uh, use the chat facility, and I promise you I will recognize you. Uh, Cass, we have a question from Craig Sumption, the CFO of Hatch Africa. Hello, Craig. Cass, can you talk about foreign investors? But are we not still scaring potential investors with talk of a state-owned bank and effectively sounding the government like government is trying to discount the value of our existing banks? Do you want to take that one on, Cass? 
Consider yeah, your so this is role. something. <laughs> I mean, we've been dealing with even while I was at the banking association, and and this is where, uh, you know, this is where the the problems of the ANC come into government. So, at a meeting we had with the president actually in October 2019, uh, a very frank meeting with him and his advisors, he acknowledged that his cabinet is not aligned behind him that he find it difficult to to unite them. Uh, and the, that's the faction in the ANC playing out, right? Some of it is factional stuff, some of it is ideological stuff. So we have a misaligned cabinet. We have uh, on a particular issue, you might have three different views on three ministers. And so, I mean, what we try to impress upon the president is that you can't say that you want to look at land expropriation in a way that does not have a negative impact on investment and on food security. And the next day, one of your ministers stands up and say, we're going to expropriate land if we need to. Uh, we're not going to take anything else into account. Uh, because that then sends a message to investors that this is not a a, a, a consistent policy environment that there's political differences and that the president doesn't have the support of his cabinet. Now, you know, absolutely we need to try and convince them not to do that. Now, again, I go back to the new Minister of Finance. You need somebody with the courage and the sort of gravitas in the ANC itself to say the difficult thing. So on the basic income grant, which is being promoted by a lot of people in the ANC, in Ogodongwana, one of the first public statements he made, he said, no, this, I, I cannot support this. We need a more sustainable solution to unemployment and inequality. We don't have the money for this. And, and I can't support a basic income grant. And that to a certain extent has sort of pushed that debate into the background. Not that it's not there, but it pushed that debate into the background. The release of a green paper on social security by the Minister of Social Development, we all came out fully against it, including the Minister of Finance, and she had to withdraw it. So I think that we need to keep that pressure up. And, and if we have those sorts of people in government who are prepared to stand up and say, look, forget all the ideological stuff. This just does not make sense for the country. And this is what we should be doing. Then we beginning to shift that slowly. If I was a foreign investor sitting somewhere looking at all of this and knowing that there are other destinations that are essentially sending out a very clear crisp message that we want your investment, I would obviously go there. But we do have some you know, ad advantages in South Africa. We have a diversified economy. We have reasonably good infrastructure. We have, and touch wood, it remains a reasonably good judicial system. There are some positives that we can build on and that would be attractive to investors. And so, again, I think that, you know, we can, we can say, well, we haven't made much progress on all of this up to now. But all I'm saying is that in the last few months, there's these glimmers of hope. And I've got to work with those glimmers of hope. And I've got to push through those glimmers of hope and 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 try and we've got to try our best to actually change the way government is communicating. Keep on pushing home the point that the cabinet needs to be aligned and he needs to actually deal with that. Uh, so are there any, can I tell you, yes, this is going to happen or no, this is not going to happen? Of course not. I mean, that's not the environment we are in. That's not how things work. But, you know, what's the alternative to this? The alternative to working with the glimmers of hope, of hope is to say, well, we are a failed state. It's not going to work. Let's take our money elsewhere. And... Look, I ain't going anywhere, so I can't let that happen. 
Cast, I for one am taking away some, some encouraging messages here. And I appeal to all those on the call today. If you taking the situation as seriously you do by participating in forums such as this, I think we need to keep the pressure up. We need to make sure our voices are heard. We need to engage constructively and hold the feet of those accountable to the fire. We need to keep reminding them of their responsibility to SA Inc. And that's up to you and I, whether it be in a boardroom, around the dining room table, whether at the dinner party, we need to keep the pressure up constructively and let our voices be heard. Kath, thank you for that incisive response. We've got literally three minutes before I hand over for the vote of thanks and the closing remarks. So is it um, one last opportunity for someone to raise a hand if you'd like to address a question to Cass? And I will also still take a question on the chat facility. Um, the countdown starts. Anyone else? Right, then I'm going to end off with a question from another question from Craig Sumption at, at Hatch. I think this one is more in hope than in than in anger. Cass, the president meets with CEOs from time to time. But is there a forum where the finance minister meets with CFOs? You want to take that one on, Cass? <laughs> No, there isn't. Uh, there isn't, and and that's an interesting question. I think I think it's something we should consider. Uh, although I'm not too sure whether the finance minister is the appropriate person to meet with CFO. Maybe the finance minister together with the director general of treasury. Um, but that's an interesting question, and maybe it's something that we need to raise with the finance minister. I think it would be very useful because it would give him an insight from the people who are actually grappling uh, with the uh, the way companies are run, the financial situation they find themselves in, and so on. Uh, something that I, I will definitely raise with him. I think it's an interesting observation. Well, uh, if for no other reason, Cass, that was certainly. Uh uh, a response that uh, came from left field and, and it just shows the value <laughs> yeah. of these engagements when you speak with the right people. Yeah. Well researched, structured and constructive dialogue. So thank you for that, Cass. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Alan Edwards, who only recently touched down in South Africa. And I think Alan would be fair to say you just barely got your feet under the desk and I've been all over you. Uh, wanting to know what happens in the new year. <laughs> Adam, Adam is, is, uh, has just started his tour of duty as the head of office uh, at the High Commission of Canada Trade Commission Services. And Alan, it's perhaps appropriate uh, that at this stage, on behalf of Second Cham, members, uh, the business community, our partners, uh, provincial government, we have representatives here today, uh, just to welcome you, to you and your family, wishing you a, a, a constructive and a positive tour of duty. We know you've served uh, Canada uh, diligently around the world, so, and we're looking forward um, to working with you as a chamber. So, Alan, on that note, uh, I'd also like to just welcome some of my other colleagues from the uh, Trade, uh, the Trade Commission of Services. I know there are some of you online today, and a warm welcome to you as well. So, Alan, if I could ask you for some concluding remarks and a vote of thanks. Over to you, Alan. Well, absolutely. First of all, i got to say thank you to you, Mike, uh, because uh, quite frankly, when you're new on the ground, I've done this six times before, it's really good to have somebody who actually tells you what to do. So that's that's a good <laughs> thing. I appreciate it, Mike. So, so very much. Uh, and, and on that line of, of being new to, to South Africa, it, it's, uh, you know, it's I'm still in that that sucking up all of the information I possibly can mode. Uh, which is why this this meeting today has just been fantastic for me. Uh, just being able to talk about these 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 issues that are so pertinent, so important for this. You know, not just the you know the the, the relationship between corporate South Africa and government South Africa. This is about the future of South Africa, and and so uh, it's been a very very interesting and uh, and I think important discussion we've had today. So I mean, I have to start off first by saying thank you, Cass. That was fantastic. Uh, your your you know incisive observations about not only the 
the political uh, machinations that we we have to deal with, but the the challenges facing corporate South Africa in in, in infrastructure and and uh, debt, energy security, all of those things uh, have been really really important uh, to discuss and to bring out in the open, and and as Mike says, to talk about freely and, and constructively. So thank you so much. I've really really appreciated your uh, your your insights. Um, I also want to thank everybody who has participated because we've had such interesting questions that have actually spurred even more conversation. And so uh, I really appreciate everyone for, for participating and asking these questions. Um, and then just, just finally, uh, I want to say, you know, to, to uh, Sakan Cham, uh, it's, it's a mouthful. It takes a little while to get used to saying that. Sakan Cham. Um, for, for organizing this because it is an important discussion. Um, you know, it, it really surprises me how much business around the world is the same in what they want from their governments. They want their governments to listen, first of all. Just, they wanna know that they're not being brushed off. They wanna be, they wanna be heard. They don't necessarily have to get everything they want, but they want consistency in policy, consistency in regulatory, uh, uh, regulatory affairs, and they want common sense. And, uh, and quite frankly, that's what I'm hearing here today. And uh, that's what I would hear if I were having a conversation like this with the uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Japan or the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan or wherever else I've been. So I really appreciate that. And, and I definitely am here to support any way I can, um, you know, in, in my dealings with the uh, South African government. So with that, thank you to everybody. And thank you for giving me this chance to, to speak, Mike. Thank you. And, and welcome from the business community. Um, oh, thank you very much. Well, I've, 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 now, I've shed my 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 dubious past that was all black and now i'm cheering green and gold so there you go <laughs> well cass your welcome certainly trumps mine a few weeks ago but i'm used to being outdone by you cass it's just from my side on behalf of second champ to all our members and partners thank you for your support continue to watch your inboxes we've got some interesting opportunities coming forward for engagement they will still be virtual for the foreseeable future but thank you for your support Cass from my side it's always a pleasure you are always so gracious in terms of giving me an opportunity um, to be heard so thank you for that Cass I, I really do and we know that our interests and that of the business community is in safe hands so thank you to you and your colleagues at BUSA all the best Cass and to you Alan thank you so much until next time be safe and stay well. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers Bye. all. So Cheers. Bye. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers everyone. Bye. Oh.